next speaker professor kaushal varma kaushal is a very special person for me he has been my teacher and my advisor since my days at iac bangalore if i were to describe him i would say that he is an epitome of calmness and composure so it gives me actually a lot of pleasure to have him here as a speaker he is currently the dean of sciences at iac bangalore he is also the recipient of he has done a lot of work in the area of several complex variables today he is going to speak on the capacity metric and suita's conjecture Over to you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pranav, for the very kind in, and very generous uh, introduction. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, so before we begin, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, the invitation to participate in this event. So I'm very happy to be here. Of course, uh, you know, I would have loved to come over physically and meet uh, everyone and participate physically. But I guess given the circumstances, this is the best that we can do. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so uh, the the talk today is going to be on uh, a very classical topic in complex analysis, uh, one variable complex analysis. Um, uh, this is uh, about uh, what is called the capacity metric and uh, as conjecture. I'll be telling you a little bit about uh, both these topics, and uh, I think it is uh, very interesting because. tools that were developed in higher dimensions were found to be particularly useful in addressing these questions so of late there has been renewed interest and a lot of synergy between uh, the one variable world and the higher dimensional world and i think this makes for a very uh, fascinating uh, you know back and forth of ideas which has you know uh, given rise to more new questions in one variable as well as uh, more new techniques are being developed in high dimension okay so uh, uh, let's get started and uh, i'll keep uh, the technicalities to a bare minimum so as to give you some flavor of uh, what is going on here um okay so here's the overview uh, i'd like to start by recalling some basic things about uh, the green's function definition of the capacity metric and we will see some related topics uh, about uh, uh, capacity metric uh, next i will describe uh, sweta's conjecture and its affirmative resolution by spigniew plotsky uh, this happened in 2013 this has uh, led to a number of uh, uh, very interesting theorems in the recent past uh, then uh, it turns out that uh, plotsky is one variable uh, work Uh, can be reformulated to give you uh, a higher dimensional version of sweta's conjecture and uh, in this uh, there is a very interesting biholomorphic invariant uh, which i have called blotsky's invariant and uh, we will uh, we will see what this is all about and then i will close the talk by uh, describing some uh, very recent related results about uh, uh, the higher dimensional uh, sweta's the next plan of the talk okay so let's begin by recalling uh, what the green function is and uh, the definition of the capacity metric so uh, we will start off with the domain d in uh, the complex plane and uh, just for simplicity i will assume that this is a bounded domain never mind about non polar boundary and so on let's take a nice uh, bounded domain in the complex plane and uh, you fix a point p in the domain d uh then uh, as we all know uh, the green's function for this domain uh, with the pole at point p e is a function which i'm denoting as g sub b and it satisfies the following two properties so first of all uh, g sub b uh, has to be a harmonic function on the complement of the point p e. so dd bar of dd is 0 on d minus p and uh, secondly i would like the green's function to vanish in the boundary so gd equals 0 on the the boundary here so just to summarize uh, you fix a point p uh, the green's function is harmonic away from it uh, and uh, in fact uh, it vanishes on the boundary and it uh, has a logarithmic singularity at the end. so these are properties that uh, characterize the green's function mm -hmm. So now, since uh, G sub D has a logarithmic singularity, I can look at uh, 
dv plus log of mod z minus t. And that's going to give me a nice harmonic function. So I can take the limit as z approaches the pole p. And uh, you know, just by the Dirichlet problem and so on, you can show that uh, this limit exists. And uh, this is denoted in the literature by lambda d uh, at the point p. So lambda d at the point p is, is what is called the Roman constant. Uh, uh, exists everywhere. And a little bit of work uh, actually tells us that the map p maps to lambda of p is actually a real analytic uh, function. This is uh, this follows from classical uh, potential. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what happens if you start looking at conformal maps uh, of the main D? The point here is we are trying to understand how the Green's function transforms. We are trying to understand how the Roban function transforms. So I take uh, uh, a conformal map. Uh, phi from D onto another planar domain omega. And uh, uh, just by using properties of the green function, uh, one can show that uh, the Roban function actually transforms as shown here. So lambda at the point P is lambda in the, in the range space at the point phi of P minus uh, a term which depends on the derivative of the conformal. So minus log of mod phi prime P can be checked without too much trouble. And if you rearrange this um, and write C sub D as the exponential of minus lambda D, yeah, just define this quantity. It's a pointwise function. Uh, the equation tells you that C sub D actually transforms as C D at the point P equals C omega at the point P times the modulus of the derivative of phi. And uh, while this is already interesting, um, uh, it is doubly so because now I can interpret CD times mod DZ as a conformal metric on the domain D because it transforms correctly under conformal maps. And this object is called the capacity metric on, on D. Yeah? So what this means is if you, if you fix a point, uh, say, say Z naught in your domain, and you give yourself a vector v, which is based at the point z0. The length of this vector v under the conformal metric will be, you take the Euclidean norm of v, and you multiply that by a fudge factor, which is cd at the point z0. Yeah. So this is like a weighted, uh, weighted metric, conformal metric. So here's an example, which will uh, put things in perspective. Uh, if I take the simplest uh, and the most beautiful uh, domain in the complex plane, namely the unit disk, I follow through the definitions here. You can show that CD is nothing else but uh, one over one minus the modulus of the squared. Uh, and this is exactly the hyperbolic metric. The capacity metric on the unit disk in the complex plane coincides with the standard hyperbolic with the point. Now, uh, one can ask, well, what happens if your domain D is more complicated? Um, <clears throat> it turns out that the situation is not all that simple. Uh, and let me recall here a theorem of Minda. Um, it's a very old, uh, very nice theorem. Uh, so Minda shows that on a hyperbolic Riemann surface R, the capacity metric is always dominated by the hyperbolic metric. Okay, so, uh, and uh, in general, the inequality is strict um, unless you happen to be simply connected. So Minda also shows that if the capacity metric equals the hyperbolic metric at just one point, then uh, the Riemann surface is forced to be simply connected and hence uh, equivalent to the, uh, the units. So in general, uh, capacity is less than or equal to the hyperbolic. So uh, one can try to understand uh, certain properties of this metric on uh, non-simply connected domains. And uh, there are a number of questions that you can ask. For example, you could ask, you know, what, what about the curvature of this metric, for instance, formally curvature. Or you could talk about uh, the behavior of the geodesics in this. Let me give you a sampling of uh, some of these questions and what we know about them today. 
Um, and uh, this is uh, joint work with uh, Diganto Bora, Pranav Haridas. <clears throat> so uh, the theorem essentially states the following. Uh, <clears throat> so what you do is you, you start with a smoothly bounded domain D in the complex domain and assume that this is non-simply connected and they will equip this domain with the capacity metric. So, so you can ask a couple of things. Uh, you know, what about uh, geodesics, as I said, what about the curvature? theorem? So the theorem has four parts and let me take you through them uh, one at a time. So the first part states that if you look at uh, any non-trivial homotopy class of loops in D, yeah, so just look at loops and the, the homotopy class of uh, loops, non-trivial homotopy class, then every such class is going to contain a closed geodesic in the capacity. Uh, secondly, uh, one can ask uh, what is the boundary behavior of certain of these geodesics? So, so every geodesic uh, Z sub P that does not stay in a compact set for all time P, positive time P, simply hits the boundary unique point. I think this is interesting because it tells you that uh, the geodesic cannot uh, do lots of funny things near the boundary. It has to just go straight and hit the boundary at you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, number three, uh, every point Z0 that does not lie on a closed geodesic yeah, uh, actually lies on what is uh, called a geodesic spiral. So by a geodesic spiral, I mean uh, a geodesic that is non-closed and which lies in a compact set for all positive it sort of wanders around all over the place and does not quite uh, come back to its geodesic spiral. Uh, so that's sort of like a dichotomy. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so the geodesic either does not stay in a compact set or it does. If it exits every compact set, uh, then it has to hit the boundary at a unique point. And if not, you know, it, uh, you happen to be on a geodesic spiral. And lastly, um, and I think this is going to set the tone for much of the talk. The question here is, what about the conformal curvature of the capacity metric? Uh, so the fourth uh, part of the theorem says that if your boundary is smooth just near one point, say P0, then one can show that the conformal curvature of the capacity metric actually approaches minus one as you approach the point. So recall, uh, how do you uh, compute curvature? Well, the curvature is given by, uh, you take uh, the, the conformal density, which is, uh, I take log of that, and I take dd bar, and then I divide that by minus one over c squared. So the expression is uh, minus one over c squared dd bar of log c sub d. Okay? And the claim is that uh, this, this uh, this object, this expression converges to minus one. Now, <clears throat> you know, uh, the hyperbolic metric uh, has constant curvature minus one. So part four of the theorem is saying that if you're really, really close to a smooth boundary point, then uh, geometrically, the capacity metric begins to look very much like the hyperbolic metric. That's the the content of uh, part of the theorem. Asymptotically, uh, you, you begin to look like the hyperbolic. Uh, so that's the theorem. And uh, <clears throat> how do you prove such a thing? Well, uh, uh, I'll just quickly uh, tell you what we do. Uh, so if you want to understand the capacity metric, well, I better understand the Roban function because C is exponential of minus lambda. So the first thing to do is to understand uh, the boundary behavior of the Roban function, and all of its derivatives uh, near the boundary. And uh, you know one needs to worry about derivatives because to compute uh, something like the curvature, you need uh, to take at least two derivatives and so on. So the first thing is uh, hidden behind this theorem is um, is another theorem which I haven't stated. It tells you precisely how. Uh, the Roban function and its derivatives blow up uh, near, lambda, uh, near the boundary. And if I have that information, I can transport all of that to something about the capacity uh, density. So that's that's the idea. Uh, 
Uh, and once I have information on all possible derivatives, uh, what we do is write down the uh, equation for the geodesic uh, it's, it's in order of ODE. Um, the coefficients in this uh, ODE are, you know, the Christoffel symbols and so on and so forth, all of which can be written down in terms of uh, uh, the, the capacity density and its derivatives. Yeah. So, uh, so one sort of realizes the importance of controlling all possible derivatives. Write down the geodesic equation, use the information on how the capacity density blows up in the boundary. Uh, and this is how we actually prove uh, statements one to one. And I must say that the basic philosophy for analyzing the geodesic equation goes back to uh, uh, this uh, very well-known work of Pfefferman uh, in the early 70s. And, uh, you know, Pfefferman uh, proved a very nice, very beautiful theorem about uh, the geodesics in the Bergman metric. So our main motivation and inspiration comes back, uh, uh, comes uh, from Pfefferman's work. So, um, so that's about uh, geodesics in the capacity. Okay. Um, I will now move on to uh, Sweeta's conjecture. It is now a theorem. <clears throat> so let me uh, give you some background on what the conjecture states. So I take a domain omega in CN now, I fix a point P in omega, and I will recall for you the Bergman kernel on the diagonal. So K sub omega at the point P is uh, defined as a certain variational problem. So I look at the uh, class of all holomorphic functions. And I look at those uh, whose L2 norm with respect to standard limit major is at most one. And uh, in, in, in this class of uh, uh, square integrable holomorphic functions, I try to maximize the uh, modulus of f of p squared, the Bergman kernel. Uh, you may also recall that, uh, you know, this is also given uh, um, in a different way by constructing first an orthonormal sequence in your class of L2 holomorphic functions. And then, uh, you know, uh, taking the sum of the modular squares of this. And, uh, you know, just by Hilbert space theory, you have convergence in the L2 sense. And uh, this describes the Bergman kernel on the title. In general, the Bergman kernel is a function of two variables, uh, Z comma W, which is holomorphic in the first variable and anti-holomorphic in the second. And it's a reproducing kernel for all square and triple holomorphic functions. Uh, but we'll be interested in the case when z equals uh, w. So I'm looking at the diagonal here. So I've I, I haven't written z comma w. I've just written one variable. So that's the Bergman kernel. And uh, Sweeta in 19, uh, 1972 conjectured that uh, for a planar domain omega, um, <clears throat> the the square of the capacity is dominated by pi times the Bergman kernel on the diagonal. So this is uh, what he wrote down. And uh, he actually uh, gave some heuristic arguments about why he believed this conjecture to be true. It's a pretty nice uh, short paper. Um, and uh, the geometric interpretation of this uh, conjecture is the following. So, uh, you know, there's a very classical relationship between the Green's function and uh, the Bergman kernel of the diagonal. This goes back to work of Schiffer. And uh, Schiffer showed that if you look at uh, DD bar, you look at the Laplacian of log of uh, Green function, uh, <clears throat> then you actually uh, get the Bergman kernel of the diagonal. Um, and if you rephrase this and observe that uh, the log singularity doesn't really uh, matter very much, um, you get this identity which connects the Bergman kernel to the capacity, namely k equals one over pi dd bar of log of the capacity. Okay. This is known. And uh, if you just sort of rearrange some terms here and use the expression for the curvature, which uh, we have discussed, uh, Sita's conjecture is exactly telling you that the curvature of the capacity metric is at most minus one everywhere on the domain, everywhere. 
if you look at theorem part four um, that we discussed, part four said that if you are close to the boundary, uh, then you converge to minus one. Sweeta's conjecture is a much stronger statement. It tells, it is asking, it is saying that the curvature is dominated by minus one everywhere, not only near the boundary. Okay, and uh, uh, and actually, you know, uh, 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 you know, this is sort of the, the thing to keep in mind. Okay. Um, <clears throat> interest in this conjecture actually. Uh, you know, uh, came about from the several variables community uh, just before, in, in 1995 or so. And I'll explain what really happened. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, before we do that, uh, you know, I'll just make a couple of observations, quick observations. Uh, Svita's uh, uh, conjecture is true if omega is simply connected, because in that case, you know, you are equivalent to the disk. And on the disk, uh, everything can be written down and you can check that uh, capacity squared equals pi times the uh, But already for an annulus, uh, you know, uh, uh, computations which are not uh, that straightforward uh, show that you have strict inequality. There's already something interesting happening in the W. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of background uh, building up to Plotsky's proof. Uh, so uh, Osawa in 95 uh, observed that uh, to prove Suita's conjecture, uh, it is enough to uh, uh, prove the following inequality. So I take a penar domain omega, and uh, for a given point p in omega, I have to find a function f, which is holomorphic, uh, which equals one at p, and whose L2 norm is at most uh, pi divided by capacity squared at p. Okay, this was his observation. Uh, and while he could not uh, prove this completely, he uh, was able to get a much weaker uh, version of Sweeta's conjecture. Uh, he was able to show that capacity squared is at most 750 pi times the Bergman curve. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, there was progress uh, about 10 years down the line uh, by Blotsky. Uh, who was able to bring the constant down from 750 to 2. And this was done by using a much improved uh, weighted estimates for the D-bar equation in the common plane, going back to uh, work of Bo Bernson from 90. Uh, and, at the, and I must say, you know, at the background of all these uh, improvements is, uh, is a very, very remarkable extension theorem of Osawa and Takegoshi. I'll, I'll come to that in the next slide. Um, and after Blotsky's work, uh, there was further improvement uh, by Guan, Zhao, and Zhu in 2010. And um, they were able to bring down the constant from 2 to 1.0. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, so, as I was saying, you know, um, uh, the, the crux of all these um, theorems and uh, constants uh, is actually um, hinging upon an extension theorem of Osawa and Takeko. And uh, let me just, you know, uh, spend a minute or two telling you what this theorem is all about. But roughly, it says the following. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, uh, say, a pseudo convex domain, yeah. Uh, and if I give, uh, if, if I take a hyperplane, just take an analytic variety, say a hyperplane. Say z and equal to zero, for example. And I give uh, and I give myself a holomorphic function on this analytic subject. Uh, then it is a classical fact that this holomorphic function admits a holomorphic extension to the entire pseudo-convex domain omega. So analytic data on a smaller set extends to analytic data on the entire domain. So this goes back to work of Karta and so on. Um, and this was first done uh, um, uh, by very, very different methods. Osawa and Takegoshi were able to prove uh, a very remarkable extension theorem uh, of this kind, in which they were able to actually control the growth of the extension. 
Yeah. So in, in general, what they do is the following. So you start with the pseudo convex domain, say omega in CL, uh, and you look at its intersection with a uh, hyperplane, say Z is equal to zero. Uh, on Z equal to zero, you take uh, uh, a holomorphic function um, with the property that uh, you, you can control the L2 norm with respect to a certain way. Yeah. So that's your starting hypothesis. You're doing. The Osawa Takigochi theorem says that uh, such a function admits an extension with the entire domain omega not in an arbitrary manner, but in a very, very precise manner. You can actually control the L2 norm of the extension in terms of the L2 norm of the given beta. Yeah. So it's like saying that uh, you uh, you have a certain, you know, uh, this sort of this should remind you of the Han Banach theorem in some sense, you know. So you have a, a certain subspace, uh, you have a bounded functional, and you're trying to extend that to the entire. So that's the spirit of this theorem. But the idea is you can you can do this in a very, very precise uh, sense. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, Osawa's observation, which we saw the further improvements uh, by Blotsky and others, um, uh, they were all asking for a very, very optimal growth rate uh, in the osawa Takigoji uh, extension theorem. So, uh, so in around 2013, uh, you know, Blasky was able to prove the Suita conjecture. So, in which case the constant is exactly one, one times pi, and uh, the the basis of this is a very optimal version of the Osawa Takigoji theorem. And uh, it's important to mention that this is motivated by a parallel development that was going on in the D-bar equation, motivated by Chen's work. And uh, what Chen did was, uh, you know, he went back to the classical Hormander estimate for D-bar on pseudo-convex domains. And uh, he showed that the osawa takigoshi theorem can be proved directly by using the classical Hormander achievement. Uh, osawa takigoshi uh, the original proof, uh, you know, uh, did not use the, the standard uh, D-bar complex which uh, Hormander had used. Had to introduce a, a certain twist uh, to the bar complex. But Ken showed that you can actually work within the classical framework and uh, get the entire Usawa Takegochi theorem. So, based on this idea of Chen, uh, Blasky was able to prove a very nice optimal theorem. We take this here. <clears throat> so, this is the theorem of Blasky 2013. Um, and let me describe uh, what this is doing. So I take a tube domain of the following kind. Yeah? So it is Cn minus one cross a domain D. What is D? D is any domain, a bounded domain in the complex plane containing the origin. So I take uh, a tube over D. So I take D cross Cn minus one. Yeah? Just attach lines, uh, you know, copies of Cn minus one in the vertical direction. Um, <clears throat> so that's my tube domain. And, um, I let omega prime be omega intersect z n equal to zero. <clears throat> okay, so that's like a central fiber here. Then <clears throat> uh, for any function f, which is holomorphic on omega prime, yeah, and for any plurisubharmonic function phi on omega, so phi is going to play the role of a certain weight, you know, when you do the L2 theory here. Uh, so for any plurisubharmonic function phi on omega, there exists an extension capital F of little f to the entire domain such that you can control the weighted L2 norm of capital F uh, in terms of uh, the weighted L2 norm of little f. And uh, <clears throat> the constant is precisely pi divided by capacity squared at the origin. Okay. So please note that uh, the weight is, is not the standard Lebesgue measure here. But uh, I'm looking at uh, e to the minus three times uh, at least the standard uh, Lebesgue measure, and dv prime is Lebesgue measure on omega. So this is the extension theorem, and uh, once we have this, uh, you know, Peter's conjecture uh, follows uh, in uh, in a reasonably straightforward manner. <clears throat> 
Now, after uh, Blatsky's work, uh, there were uh, two other approaches. Um, and uh, the nice things about uh, these two approaches is that uh, they actually lead to other questions in uh, higher dimensions. So the first uh, approach is due to Bernson and Lampert. Uh, and they were able to uh, prove Suita's conjecture uh, by um, evoking <clears throat> um, you know, uh, the, the log pluri-subharmonicity of uh, the variation of the Bergman kernels in a family of pseudo-convex domains. So what they did was, uh, you know, uh, let's not worry about one pseudo-convex domain. Let's look at, an, uh, let's look at an entire family. For each uh, pseudo-convex domain in the fiber, you have a Bergman kernel. Uh, I take the log of that, and I try to understand how this object varies as your domain varies. It turns out that... Uh, the log of the way of the log of the Bergman kernel uh, is actually a purely subharmonic function of the parameter in the base space. That's the approach that we used. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> Blatsky himself gave uh, another proof of uh, Sweetas conjecture a little later. And at the time, he uh, uh, the approach was to obtain bounds for the Bergman kernel in terms of uh, the volumes of the sublevel sets of another object, namely the pluricomplex green function. Okay. The pluricomplex green function uh, is uh, can be regarded as a higher dimensional analog of the classical greens function that we have seen. So let me quickly recall uh, Blotsky's theorem here. <clears throat> so I take a pseudo-convex domain omega in Cn. Um, and then I look at uh, the purely complex green function with pole at the point P, and uh, that I have denoted as G sub omega. I look at the sublevel set uh, G less than minus A for A non negative. That's a certain uh, uh, bounded region in omega. I look at its standard uh, L2 uh, measure, the volume. And then it turns out that the Bergman kernel of the diagonal is bounded from below by. Uh, over e to the 2 and a times the volume of the sublevel set. <clears throat> okay. um, so that's the definition of the pluricomplex green function. It's the uh, upper envelope of all negative pluri subharmonic functions uh, with a certain property. Namely, uh, they have at most a logarithmic uh, singularity at the point. <clears throat> so that's the inequality, um, this slide here. And uh, uh, Blutsky's uh, uh, observation was that uh, when n equals 1, you're in the complex plane, uh, you take the limit uh, on both sides as a goes to minus, as a goes to infinity. Um, <clears throat> and uh, miraculously, you know, the limit exists. And, uh, uh, you know, you get exactly the inequality in sweetness conjecture. Nothing to be done. You just have to show that the limit exists, and uh, there it is. Sweetas conjecture is proved. Um, and now you can see the uh, the questions that one can ask in higher dimensions. Yeah, uh, this inequality of Blotsky can be uh, thought of as uh, an analog of Sweetas conjecture in higher dimensions. So, does the limit exist as a go to infinity, for example? Yeah. Um, and if it does, uh, what do you get? So it turns out that when uh, in higher dimensions, if you uh, take a convex domain, geometrically convex domain, uh, the limit uh, uh, involving the volume and so on actually exists again. And here is a very, very nice theorem of Plutsky. He observes that uh, for a convex domain, uh, the Bergman kernel on the diagonal is bounded from below by one over the Lebesgue measure of the indicatrix of the Kobayashi metric. So the Kobayashi metric is uh, is the analog of the Poincaré metric in higher dimensions. Yeah, it allows you to measure the uh, length of uh, tangent vectors. The indicatrix is basically uh, the the collection of all uh, vectors <clears throat> whose norms are at most one in the Kobayashi. Uh, that's a certain region in the tangent space. At yeah, uh, sort of like a ball uh, in the tangent space. So uh, I take the volume of that, and that gives you uh, the lower bound in the Bergman. Um, okay. 
So, um, so Blotsky then defined uh, an invariant, uh, which um, I, I call the F invariant. Um, so um, you take your domain omega, um, uh, equip that with the Kobayashi metric. So think hyperbolic metric. So I will define F omega k at a point P to be the product of the Bergman kernel at P times the volume of the Kobayashi indicatrix at the point. That's my, that's my invariant. Uh, this turns out to be a biholomorphic invariant because uh, uh, the way the kernel transforms is uh, it's exactly one over uh, the rate at which the volume of the indicatrix transforms. So the, uh, uh, the transformation factors actually cancel out and F turns out to be a biholomorphic. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, um, so for a convex domain, uh, Blotsky and Zvonek uh, showed that um, F invariant is bounded below by one. That's simply because of the uh, the lower bound in the Bergman kernel. That's just rearranging terms. But the interesting thing is that they obtained uh, a universal upper bound, namely four to the power of n. Yeah. So the Bergman kernel times the volume is at most four to the power of n. So the interesting thing here is that uh, you know this is a universal constant uh, does not depend on the domain at all. And uh, uh, for pseudo convex domains, uh, which are not quite convex in the geometry sense, um, you know uh, they define the F invariant using a different metric, uh, which is the Azukawa metric. The Azukawa metric is defined in terms of the Turi complex Green function. And uh, they were able to show that uh, the F invariant with respect to the Azukawa metric is also bounded from below by one forward points. So you can already see the difference uh, between the convex case and the pseudo convex case. Uh, for the convex case, uh, the Kobayashi metric works. For the pseudo convex case, uh, you need to tweak the metric. Uh, in fact, the limit exists, you know, uh, in the sub level set uh, calculation. And you don't get uh, <clears throat> the indicator of the Kobayashi metric, but you get the Azukawa metric. And uh, I must say that uh, behind these theorems is, uh, uh, is the well-known work of uh, Lempert, uh, which shows that uh, on a convex domain, every uh, distance decreasing metric is the same. So Parathedori equals Kobayashi equals Azukawa equals anything else that one can do. Um, so theorem, uh, the second part of the theorem is more general. Um, and the first part is actually very, very pretty, you know, because of the four to the power. Okay. okay, so here are some uh, uh, related results. Um, so now, uh, you know, in high dimensions, uh, there are many, many more metrics, as I just indicated. Um, so one can start playing around with uh, all possible metrics. So let tau be any invariant metric on a domain. Um, one can define uh, Blotsky's F invariant with respect to tau. Uh, so that would be you take the Bergman kernel at a point P, uh, take the indicatrix with respect to the invariant metric tau, take its uh, volume and multiply them. That's the F invariant with respect to tau. And uh, one way to state the higher dimensional sweep of conjecture is that the F invariant with respect to tau is always bounded from below by okay. That's... one way to state this. So there are a couple of uh, uh, very natural questions that one can ask. So, I could take uh, tau to be the Karateodori metric or the Kobayashi metric. You can try to study uh, uh, the, the F invariant on pseudo convex domains, not necessarily convex. Yeah. Um, and the other question is, you know, uh, much more specific. Um, you know, let's take a, a very simple domain. Uh, um, so what I've written down there is a domain in C2. So it consists of pairs z comma w and c2 such that uh, modulus of z squared plus uh, the modulus of w to the 2m is less than 1. m is uh, something positive. So 
you know, you should think of this as uh, uh, some perturbation of the ball. So the ball m equals one, uh, and which is a very nice uh, uh, convex. Uh, uh, these are actually egg-shaped domains, you know, because of uh, the weight 2m on the new variable. So these are ellipsoids in some sense. In, in some sense. Um, and uh, these have been studied quite extensively because uh, one can hope to, you know, compute things on these models. So one question could be, uh, is it possible to compute the uh, invariant on these uh, simple model domains? So uh, well, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, some recent joint work uh, with uh, Malakumar, uh, Dikanto Bora, and Prachi Mahajan. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing uh, that was done was, uh, you know, we uh, take a C2 smooth, strongly pseudoconvex domain. And strongly pseudoconvex simply means, uh, in, in one way, uh, you know, the boundary sort of locally looks like uh, uh, as, as a very good approximation to uh, Ball. So you can locally convexify it and, and so on. So you're very, very close to the, uh, to the boundary of a ball uh, at every boundary. But uh, globally, you may not be uh, necessarily biholomorphic to the ball. Uh, so there are um, you know, classical examples of strongly pseudo-convex domains that are not even convex. Um, Okay, so we take one such uh, C2 smooth, strongly pseudo-convex domain, and uh, we can consider three invariant metrics. Uh, we take tau to be Karthidori, Azukawa, or Kobayashi. Okay, so let's see uh, metrics. And uh, the first observation is that, uh, you know, the F invariant can actually be localized near the boundary. What does that mean? Mm -hmm means that uh, you take any uh, point zeta on the boundary uh, and you fix a small enough neighborhood u of, of the zeta. Okay? Uh, then you look at the domain u intersect omega, that's an honest domain in Cn, and I can compute its f invariant. So that's the uh, expression uh, uh, in the numerator that you see there. So this is the f invariant for the domain u sub omega. And I divide that by the F invariant for the entire domain omega. Yeah. I look at this ratio uh, and I take the limit as Z approaches zeta, the fixed boundary point. And uh, one can show that this ratio actually approaches one. So this is saying that uh, if you really want to understand the boundary behavior of this uh, F invariant, uh, you need to really focus on uh, just a little tiny piece uh, of the domain uh, that's, that's close to the boundary point. Everything else far away is, is irrelevant in some sense. So that's uh, a useful localization observation. And uh, the second uh, part of the theorem is that uh, when you take the limit as you approach uh, any boundary point, then the F invariant with respect to the Karathiodori, Azukawa, or the Kobayashi matrix all converge to one. Okay. So, uh, uh, as I said, this was motivated by uh, the high dimensional analog of the Suita conjecture, so saying that yes, um, you are close to one. Okay. <clears throat> uh, first theorem. Uh, I think to the second question. Uh, so. We are looking at uh, these ellipsoidal uh, or egg-shaped domains, uh, mod z squared plus mod w to the two mu less than one. Here I'm allowing mu to be any positive uh, uh, real. Yeah. And uh, it's a little calculation tells you that if mu is at least half, then uh, these eggs are actually convex domains geometrically. But uh, the moment uh, mu drops uh, below half, uh, then these become non and uh, if mu is at least half, uh, Blotsky and Zvonek have obtained expressions for the F invariant uh, for the Kobayashi metric. Um, the actual question was what happens in the non-convex case, mu is half. Now, um, uh, the second theorem, which I will uh, I'll talk about, uh, will give you certain estimates on the F invariant. But you will notice in the theorem that uh, 
you know, uh, we have computed this F invariant only on very specific points, namely points of the form zero comma P. So the first variable is zero. So I'm sort of looking at points uh, on, a, on a hyperplane there. And the question is, you know, why do we just focus on these points? What about uh, all other points? It turns out that, uh, you know, because the F invariant is, uh, is uh, a holomorphic invariant, one can actually appeal to the automorphism group of these domains. Yeah. Um, one can write down on the entire automorphism group. Uh, they turn out to be non-compact Lie groups. And because your F invariant is a biholomorphic uh, invariant, uh, the value of F is going to be constant along orbits of this. Yeah. And one can show that every orbit actually intersects uh, uh, the Z2 axis. So it's enough to focus on points of the form 0, P, and we don't really have to bother about any other point. Enough to just write down some calculations for points. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, uh, the following estimates hold uh, when u is less than half. So the F invariant uh, with respect to the Kobayashi metric. Please note, this is a theorem only for Kobayashi. Um, and I'll explain why. Uh, we do not know if it holds for Cartier-Dori or uh, Azukawa. So um, the F invariant is, uh, uh, is bounded from above and below by expressions A and B, where A and B are, uh, are explicit expressions depending on P and uh, uh, the parameter mu. Mm -hmm. So um, you can see what they, what they look like. Okay. Um, where are they coming from? Um, <clears throat> so what's the, uh, so, okay. So I've given you two theorems here. Uh, let me quickly take you through uh, some idea of the proof just to give you a sense of uh, what really happens. Uh, so let's look at the, uh, look at the first theorem. Um, so uh, the first statement was about localizing uh, the F invariant. Uh, this can be done because uh, F is the product of uh, the Bergman kernel and the Kobayashi indicator. So it's enough to localize uh, both K and the indicatrix uh, separately. Uh, localizing K is a classical fact. Uh, you can always do that uh, near uh, strongly pseudo-convex points. The idea is, you know, because your boundary can be locally convexified, uh, there is what is called the peak function. Peak functions are holomorphic functions that extend continuously up to the boundary and achieve a maximum of one. So you should think of them as barrier functions from potential theory or PDE. So there are analogs in the holomorphic attributes. So using uh, these barrier functions, one can localize the Bergman kernel and one can localize the Kobayashi metric also. And if you can localize the metric, uh, you can localize the indicator. And this, uh, all this is classical. So the F invariant can be localized. Uh, the second uh, part was to show that the limit of the F invariant actually equals one as you approach the boundary. And uh, this requires uh, several steps. So you uh, just a very, very quick uh, run through here. Um, so uh, the idea is to go back to uh, you know Pinchuk's uh, dilation of coordinates or what is called the scaling method, uh, and let me describe this uh, very quickly to you. So fix a boundary point zeta, um, yeah, and because uh, I'm in the strongly pseudo-convex case, I can locally convexify this. So I have a geometrically convex domain, and I'm fixing a boundary point. And uh, I try to approach this boundary point by means of a sequence, say P sub J, okay? So P sub J converges to zeta. Now for every P sub J, I compute its distance to the boundary. That I'm denoting as uh, delta P J in my expression in uh, the second part here, okay? So delta P sub J is going to zero because your P Js are converging to the boundary. 
and uh, what uh, what uh, Pintuk does, uh, uh, and this was technology developed for uh, using very very different vessels. Uh, it's a different fact that this philosophy has been so useful in uh, understanding many questions in uh, complex analysis. So Pintuk considers the uh, the following uh, linear map. So L sub J. Uh, L sub J is uh, simply uh, uh, is a diagonal matrix uh, whose entries in the first uh, n minus one uh, diagonals are one over the square root of delta P J, and the nth term is one over delta P J. Uh, <clears throat> because delta P J is going to zero, uh, you know these uh, maps actually have the property that uh, they actually expand and blow up any small neighborhood of, of P simply because they are expanding. Yeah? So, so uh, uh, any compact set uh, containing the boundary point zeta actually gets blown up to all of Cn and such. And Pinchuk's observation was that if I subject a strongly pseudo-convex boundary to these dilation of coordinates, uh, something very interesting happens. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you so you take your domain omega, which is strongly pseudo convex, and start applying these LJs to it. You get a sequence of domains omega j, and uh, one can show that these omega j's actually converge to the ball B n. Yeah. So this is a very very precise way to make sense of the philosophy that a strongly pseudo convex hypersurface is almost like a ball. Yeah, that's that's what this is. Uh, so. so what we do is to understand the uh, the F invariant, uh, we subject our domain omega to these uh, um, non-isotropic dilations. Uh, so I get a sequence of domains omega j. Each omega j has its own F invariant, uh, which I'm calling uh, F sub omega j. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and the idea now is to show that f uh, omega j actually converges to f of the unit ball, which is known to be equal to one just by standard calculations. So that's the philosophy. So <clears throat> uh, the goal is to show step three, namely that the uh, uh, f invariant of omega j is actually converges to one. Now, uh, one has to be a little careful here because uh, the moment you apply these transformation of coordinates, everything is getting disturbed. The Bergman kernel transforms, uh, the indicatrix also transforms, and so on. Ultimately, the, the crux of the proof is how do you control these uh, kernels, k omega j? And uh, secondly, how do you control the Kobayashi metric on this family of domains? So one has to prove uh, two uh, stability theorems. And uh, the stability theorem for the Bergman kernel is very reminiscent of a classical uh, fact uh, that was proved by Ramadanov. Uh, um, and uh, it, it basically says that if you have this uh, sequence of domains omega j that converges to the ball in the Hausdorff sense, then the kernels converge uniformly on compact sets. And uh, because your kernel happens to be holomorphic and conjugate holomorphic, all the derivatives also converge by the formula and so on. And uh, uh, in, in the same spirit, one has to control the Kobayashi metric. So uh, the theorem there is that uh, as omega j converges to the ball, um, the Kobayashi metric on the domain omega j converges to the Kobayashi metric on the ball. Uh, the moment you have convergence of the matrix, uh, the indicatrix also converges without too much problem. Um, <clears throat> so that's the idea of the first proof. Uh, for the second the calculation for the uh, ellipsoid e to epsilon or t to mu at the point zero p. So uh, fortunately, one can write down uh, an explicit expression for the Bergman kernel at zero comma p, and there it is. It's in terms of p e and mu. Uh, so it remains to actually compute the volume of the Kobayashi indicatrix. Now it's not possible to actually compute it, but uh, what was done was uh, to approximate this indicatrix from outside and inside by honest ellipsoids, yeah? 
uh, the indicators can be complicated, but you try to fit in uh, uh, an ellipsoid from within and uh, try to find an ellipsoid that encompasses this indicators and try to do it in an optimal manner. So we had to use another technical construction going back to who uh, this is um, very, very nice uh, metric uh, that who defined. Uh, and uh, this is uh, quite closely related to the Kobayashi metric. <clears throat> so uh, using this comparison of ellipsoids, uh, we are able to write down uh, uh, volume, compute their volumes, you just multiply these two and you get the expressions A and B that were indicated in the second. That's how you get those. Uh, uh, okay. uh, some other general properties uh, of the F invariant. Um, turns out that the F invariant admits a removable singularity type theorem. So if I take uh, any arbitrary domain omega, and if I remove from it uh, a variety of codimension at least two, uh, then uh, the, the F invariant uh, does not change. So F of omega minus V is F of omega. Yeah. And uh, this is not true if the co-dimension is one, then one can write down simple conference. Uh, okay. The other general fact is that uh, the map Z going to the F invariant at Z is always lower semi-continuous in general. And it is continuous if the Kobayashi metric happens to be continuous on omega cross CL and non-degenerate in the sense that uh, it's strictly positive every time. Okay. These are general facts. Um, um, curious, uh, uh, but uh, useful. And uh, finally, uh, you know, moving away from strongly pseudo-complex domains, uh, one can ask what happens for general pseudo-complex domains. Uh, and uh, we were able to say something on, uh, <clears throat> on what is called the class of H extendable domains. So these are domains that, uh, that contain strongly pseudo-convex domains as examples. Uh, they also contain convex finite type domains uh, and a whole host of other examples. By the way, this term finite type is, uh, is a technical condition. Uh, it simply says that, uh, you know, uh, um, roughly speaking, you know, there are no analytic varieties sitting inside the boundary of your uh, domain here. Okay, that like an order of contact. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So, so here's the theorem. Uh, so I take a bounded uh, pseudo-convex domain omega in C n plus one, uh, that is H extendable at a given boundary point P naught. Now, uh, if your domain were to be strongly pseudo-convex, and we have seen that uh, by doing the dilation uh, technology, uh, you converge to the ball. You know, that's, uh, that's like a model domain associated to strongly pseudo-convex. Now, in this case, uh, you can still associate a model domain, but it's a little more complicated. It's uh, what I have denoted as omega sub infinity. It's an unbounded domain, uh, which is described by the real part of Z0 plus a polynomial P depending on uh, the other n variables, strictly less than zero. Uh, and P happens to be a weighted homogeneous polynomial of total weight one. Um, doesn't matter. So the philosophy in mind, strongly pseudo-convex, ball, H extendable, something else. Now uh, I fix this boundary point P naught and I allow myself freedom to approach it, not in any other way, but through a non-tangential comb with vertex at P naught. So the manner is restricted in, in which I can approach P sub zero here. Okay. So the theorem says that if I approach uh, P sub zero through this comb gamma, then the F invariant has a well-defined limit and this limit is in principle computable. It's in fact the F invariant of the model domain omega sub infinity at a fixed base point, which I'm calling B. B is the point with coordinates minus one comma zero prime, which belongs to omega sub infinity. So uh, this is uh, a technical theorem here, but uh, again, the philosophy goes back to this strongly sort of in, in which omega sub infinity was the ball, and B happens to be the center in that. 
In that case, you can actually compute what the limit is. It turned out to be one. In this case, uh, all we can do is to show that uh, there's a well-defined limit, which uh, is which depends on omega sub infinity. And uh, it's it's uh, not difficult to write down examples which show that the non-tangential cone condition cannot be drawn. Okay. Um, um, just to sort of finish off here, uh, you know, let me uh, recall the theorem of Blotsky and Zwonek uh, for convex domains. Remember, they were able to show that uh, you have a lower bound of one and four to the n for convex domains. So uh, this proposition is sort of motivated by that in spirit. So if you look at a smoothly bounded Levy co-rank one domain, uh, never mind the technicalities, uh, these can be non-convex and so on. And there exist constants little c and capital C uh, positive, depending only on omega such that f invariant with respect to the Kobayashi metric emits these bounds for all z near the boundary of omega. So, in that sense. so think of little c as one, capital C as philosophy. Okay. And uh, lastly, uh, moving away from uh, smoothly bounded domains, you know, one can ask uh, what happens if you have uh, non-smooth boundaries as well. So here is uh, one example that we considered. So instead of looking at a single smoothly bounded strongly pseudo-convex domain, uh, we take finitely many of them and you look at the common intersection. Of them. So you get a piecewise smooth uh, um, and uh, the other technical assumption is that, uh, you know, wherever possible, uh, the intersections are in general position. And uh, here's, the, here's the theorem. Uh, so I take omega, which is described as a sub-level set of uh, rho 1, uh, rho 2, rho sub j. So these rho i's are actually strongly pseudo-convex uh, hypersurfaces. So I'm intersecting finitely many of them. The theorem just in C2. And I take a non smooth boundary point. Non smooth here will mean that I have to lie on uh, you know, the uh, points where two or more of these hypersurfaces intersect. And the assumption is that uh, the intersection is always in general. So I have stated a meta theorem here uh, just because the full statement is rather long and technical. So the theorem says that it's possible to determine the limiting behavior of the F invariant with respect to the Kobayashi metric as you approach uh, the singular boundary point P0. The limits are not unique and the limits depend on the nature of approach. Yeah. So just like uh, the previous theorem, uh, we had to restrict ourselves in a cone. Yeah? So uh, you could either approach through a cone or you could approach tangentially or you could do a mix of both. You know? So uh, depending on how you approach the point P0, uh, you get a bunch of, uh, of limits. And again, the main ingredient of the proof is again a suitable dilation of coordinates. Uh, the philosophy going back to Kinjo. Stability theorems uh, for the Bergman kernel and the Kobayashi indicatrix. And, uh, you know, one sort of summarizing statement here is that the model domains that you get um, are either the ball or the pi disk, that's the disk cross disk, or a Siegel domain of the second kind. So that's metric domain. Yeah. Um, and the theorem says that the limiting behavior is uh, the value of the F invariant on the ball with the by disk or this single domain. Okay. So that's the, uh, that's, uh, that's all I had to say. Uh, just one last comment here. Uh, you will notice that uh, 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 apart from the strongly pseudo convex case in which we considered Karate Dori as well as Azukawa, all the other domains, uh, all the other theorems talked about just the Kobayashi metric. There's a reason for uh, sticking to Kobayashi. Uh, Karate Dori and Azukawa are uh, very difficult to deal with. Uh, we don't really have a grip on these metrics on very general domains. So Kobayashi is, uh, is, is the one that was preferred to define um, the, uh, the analog of the high dimensional uh, Sweta conjecture and uh, these are certain um, uh, conclusions that one can draw. Most important slide of the talk. Thank you very much. And we'll...
Thank you so much for the talk. So let's move to the questions. Are there any questions here? So let me ask uh, Anup if there are any questions in the YouTube comment section. No, there are no questions in YouTube session. OK, thank you. Let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, very nice uh, participating in the conference. Thank you.